So what I'm going to talk about now is our findings on uh, our research at the TRV chair. Uh, we've done several studies here at uh, our business clinic. And uh, I think one of the major problems with the TRV chair is that we do not have a lot of evidence uh, on both diagnostics and treatment with the chair. We have a lot of expert opinion, uh, persons like myself and also uh, Dr. Vuitton in uh, Marseille. We all believe, most of us, I, I think, that actually have a lot of experience that the TRV chair works and that it is very efficient. But in order to you know, move it to higher levels, you actually need to do some clinical studies. So what we've done here in Olbo is we have tried to design a lot of studies to try and answer some of the questions that you actually wonder about when you have a lot of experience with the chair. And what is also needed is a more standardized protocol for both uh, diagnostics and treatment. We need kind of a manual for that. And I think that was one of my major uh, concerns and also one of my major problems in the beginning uh, with uses of the TRV chair that we did not have a manual. And uh, we tried to, to overcome that problem. So we actually made our own manual here in Olborg. And it's available on, on the internet if you want to uh, get some some uh, information on how we do it here. It's not because it's the only way to do it, but it's one way of doing it. The first study we did was actually to ask ourselves, do this chair work? And I think that's a very important question because if you buy this chair and you start using it, you should also be confident that it actually works. Uh, but we, uh, we tried to do a study here where we have complex cases and we have very retractable PPPV cases. And we found that it was very efficient, both in terms of uh, diagnosing uh, BPPV location, but also the individual canal and also the subtype of BPPV. And we also treatment-wise found out that it was, it was actually very efficient in the treatment of BPPV, both for the retractable cases and the multi-canal cases, and also both subtypes of BPPV meaning both cannula and cubital lithosis. The next study we did was actually try and compare uh, a more standard type BPPV population with diagnostics and treatment done with the chair and diagnostics and treatments done on an examination bed, which is the more traditional type of uh, diagnostics and treatment. And we, uh, in this more standard type BPPV population, we actually found that both um, treatments offered were equally good. So in terms of the results here uh, with this study, we actually showed that if you have more like the standard type BPPV population, the TRV chair is efficient, but it's not more efficient than if you do the standard treatments uh, that are usually offered. So that's also, uh, in my opinion, worth uh, considering if uh, you might want to use the TRV chair that it might not be suitable for all BPPV cases, but more, maybe more the you know complex and retractable cases. If you look at the next slide, we um, did a study where we looked at uh, refractory BPPV cases, and we looked at the cases that uh, were diagnosed with posterior cannulolithiasis, and we wanted to see the potentiated epilim maneuver with the chair, is it actually superior to treatments offered by the chair where you just use the standard epilim maneuver? And what we found was there was actually no significant difference. They were equally good, but they were very efficient, both types of treatment, but we did not find any significant uh, improvement with the uh, potentiated epilim maneuver. So, the only thing we can say from this study is that if you look at the posterior cannulolithiasis patients, they uh, might not be the patients that need the potentiated maneuvers. Um, another study we did looked at uh, the TIV chair as a diagnostic tool. And we wanted to find out if we have the same BPPV patient diagnosed on an examination bed by traditional means. And with the TRV chair, we wanted to find out was uh, any of these two diagnostic modalities 
superior to the other one. What we did in the beginning was we had this, the same patient uh, randomized for diagnostics with either, as you know, the traditional means or the GLV chair as the first diagnostic tool. And then they, uh, they also underwent diagnostics with the other type of uh, diagnostic modality afterwards. And then we compared what did they find. And wh what we actually found was that um, they were equally good in diagnosing posterior panel lithiasis patients. But all other types of BPPE in terms of location and subtype, the TIV chair was superior. So what we believe from this study is that at the moment, uh, I, I believe that um, the TIV chair actually provides golden standard diagnostics for uh, BPPE. And again, if you want to optimize your treatment, of course, you need to optimize your diagnostics first. And then we did a study where we looked at all patients that we've had so far for the last seven years and we tried to see, okay, how does it look uh, treatment-wise? Are we actually still able to treat all our patients and what are our success rates? So if you look at the overall cumulative treatment success rates here, you can see following one treatment, 39% uh, of our patients did actually uh, get rid of their BPPV. And you can see numbers increasing with two, three, and up to 10 treatments. When, when we reached uh, 10 treatments, 94% of our patients were treated successfully. And what you can also see from the numbers uh, in parentheses is that if you look at the only uh, uh, unilateral monocanal affected patients, then uh, numbers go up even higher. And you can see following 10 treatments, you get a number of 98%. So that's actually very high in numbers. What you can also tell is that uh, if you look at treatment failures, and we define that as a need of more than 10 treatments, we have 7% of our patients being in that group. So if you only look at that, you can actually see that we, uh, we are able to treat a lot of patients with less than 10 treatments. But even though some require more than 10 treatments, it is still possible to get a successful treatment uh, of those patients. Uh, so, following our research here at uh, the Balance and Distance Clinic here in Aalborg, we have a few recommendations for the future usage of the TRV chair. So, what we would recommend is that you use the TRV chair as a kind of a golden standard for diagnostics. And if you want to use it for that, of course, you have to combine it with BNG goggles. Um, if you cannot treat your BPV by uh, standard manual maneuvers successfully, then we recommend that you use the TRV chair. And if you do that, you can determine the location, the laterality, and also the subtype of the PPV. If you have a patient with a very classic uh, BPPV history, and you have negative diagnostic testing by traditional means, we still recommend that you uh, have diagnostics done with the TRV chair. If you have retractable BPPV, we would like to recommend that you use the TRV chair because it has many, many uh, different repetition maneuvers compared to what you can do on an examination bed. What it also does is uh, it allows standardized uh, diagnostic procedures. So in terms of intra and inter examiner variation, you can try and minimize those. We, we have done some studies here in uh, Aalborg, but even though we've done a few, we believe that there is a need for a lot more studies to be done, both in terms of diagnostics, but also in terms of treatment. And uh, at some point, I also believe it would be uh, beneficial if you do some cost-benefit analysis, because I don't believe that every clinic uh, all over Denmark and all over the world should have a TRV chair, but of course there is a need for it but not for uh, every clinic, because you are actually able to both diagnose and treat a lot of, you know, the more standard type BPV patients with other means than a, than a mechanical rotational chair.